Awesome. Let me hey, set up. Coach Oldfield, thank you so much for joining me. This is the Queen City Soccer Show. We're out of Charlotte, North Carolina. We primarily cover Charlotte FC, Charlotte Independence, and uh, Crown Legacy, the reserve team for, for Charlotte FC. Um, I, I greatly appreciate it. I love the uh, the hoodie over there. Tried to try to get dressed up for you. Tried to get get ready. You know. Absolutely, man. Um, well, hey, I really don't know a whole lot about you guys. Would you Would you mind kind of sharing with me? the background on your club and some of the history. So Veronica and Erskeberg was founded in 1931. Um, it, it was founded by uh, German immigrants came over obviously pre-World War II. You know, they worked right. and lived in the city and they found this plot of land and they came out and they developed it to um, try to keep, uh, you know, their families and some of their traditions uh, intact. Uh, you know, they, they, they worked in the city, they worked in the factories and they came out and basically spent the weekends, um, you know, in the suburbs out in Bucks County, a lot of farms back then they cleared the land, built the first clubhouse, cleared some land, built a soccer field, but they left everything else wooded. The original families were from Tallheim, Germany, which is up in the East, uh, the former East Germany, kind of the, the Ore mountains, which is the Erschberg region borders the Czech Republic. So the name basically means Association of Erskeberg or, um, uh, you know, Union of Erskeberg and Erskeberg being the region. So everything that's there today is still wooded except for our soccer fields and um, our clubs. And the Tallheim logo is actually three trees, pretty similar to our logo. Yeah. I, I actually saw some comments online when we were having this whole conversation about you guys. Uh, your, your crest, your logo definitely got some positive reviews. It, it looks very traditional, and um, it, it speaks to something about identity. Um, trees, a forest, and uh, the limited amount that I know about Germany, obviously, you know, there, there is uh, a large amount of um, ancient, like, forests in that region, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, this was a, this was a, in particular, this, this region, um, because of the natural resources, everybody wanted it, and, um, uh, you know, went back and forth a little bit and changed hands. Uh, I was over in 92 after the wall came down. I was over um, with the first team from our club back into the east. And um, oh, wow. they threw a parade for us. It was amazing. Oh, wow. That's and, insane. Um, we've been sending teams, youth teams over uh, every summer for 50 plus years. Um, we have another team. We had a, a, one of our um, senior girls teams went over last year. Uh, we have uh, high school age boys going over this summer. So it's a tradition we like to keep. We reciprocate with a number of clubs. And, um, you know, Erskeberg Awa is a, the Bundesliga two side that uh, bears our name. That's in the region. Uh, we do some things with them and a couple other cities. So it's, uh, it's a pretty cool thing that we have. Nice. And you kind of touched on it a little bit, but like, how did soccer really tie into the club itself? And, in your role, can you tell me about like when you came in uh, with, with the organization and what your role is? Yes, yeah, so the current day, the, you know, what I want you to understand is that the club itself is a sport and social club. So the, there's the club element and soccer is okay. just one piece of the overall club. Um, you know, there's other groups within the club that meet there. You know, there's the bar and restaurant. They have dinner sometimes. People hold weddings there. People hold reunions there. So there's the whole club side of it. Um, sports, they started very early on. Um, they In the very beginning, it was just, you know, an adult men's team. They didn't they didn't have youth soccer. They later started adding, adding youth teams. We have a program that they call our Mighty Might program. It's, you know, it was one of the originals. So on Friday nights in the fall, it's grown to 275, four, five, and six year olds that come and get their start in soccer. And that's oh, been wow. going on for a long time. Um, later they fielded, um, you know, like a travel team in each of the age groups. So obviously, you, you know, when we were younger, it was U12 and up later it, it moved to U8 and up. So we have current day 29 youth teams. that's going to expand um, oh, wow. probably to probably as many as 36 next year, plus our seven adult teams. So um, one of the things we do better than anybody is tie in our adults or our youth. 
Um, so I got involved in the program when I was younger. I played for a rival club. Two of my best friends played for VE. Um, so I got involved and guest played with them. And I came over full time prior to going on that that trip to Germany. And then played oh, wow. so, uh, when I came back, I played under 23s and then got involved with the with the adult program. Um, so I sit on the board of the club and I'm the director of coaching. So I sit on the sports board as well. Uh, but again, it's like, it, it, even though it's all big one family, there's a couple of different purposes there. Um, I took over the team. So I was a player um, on a 97 team that went to Portland, Oregon and lost in the national final four of the amateur cup. A lot of the, oh. a lot of the group from that team uh, turned 30 in the next couple of years and went on to play in three over 30 national finals, actually won two, got, got uh, disqualified in one um, and, and finally won one outright. So as that group was doing that, I, I went from being the young guy to, um, y- you know, one of the older guys on the team. And I took over the coaching the majors basically in 1999, 2000 season. Um, did it as a player coach for a little while. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I got older, backed off and I've just been in the coaching role. So it's been about 25 seasons. But honestly, um, you know, been playing at the club full time really since I was 18. I turned 18 in Munich in the Hopper House on that trip. Oh, wow. That's so, incredible. Which makes this great yeah, iron. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, think they, um, I think they have a location in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. They, they, they do. They, it's, it's funny because they, they did a launch, uh, and they're, we, we work with them very closely. They've been a great, a great sponsor for us, but they, they did a launch in the U.S., and then it was so successful that they had to relaunch it. It went originally was with seven regional distributors. They had to relaunch as Hopper USA. Um, yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they do a great job. So yeah, I it, actually I stayed at a hotel right like in that same um, area of Chicago, and that was my very first stop. The first time I ever went to Chicago was directly into the Hopper House uh, location yep. there. So I, that I, was that's pretty incredible. I, I I've been in that one too. So yeah, it's a good time. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Um, so as far as your journey into like the U.S. Open Cup, you know, we saw the name pop up and obviously it's kind of a difficult name. I'm sure you, you've heard that many times. Um, you, you can you can call us VE Soccer for short. That's that's what everybody does. Um, yeah, but we're, we are there, – there's a couple misconceptions out there. You know, historically we compete in the United Soccer League of Pennsylvania that's been around since 1959 – that's they were one of the founding members of the league back then. So for some reason, a lot of the articles had picked up that that's when we started playing soccer. That was just when the league started. And just okay. to give you an idea, there was other German clubs. So if you were from the Bavaria region, you went to the Bavarian club. So it was really right. segregated out. It's obviously a much more melting pot today. And over time, uh, other ethnic clubs came into this league. There were Italian clubs. There were the Ukrainian nationals who were part of our league. Um, there were the Jamaican kickers. So there was all all, the, uh, um, all, all sorts of clubs, right? Um, uh, and we still compete in that league, and we're really proud of it. The path to get into the Open Cup um, went through our state tournaments back in the day. Later, when the MLS finally formed, they, they revamped it. And so there was a time when we were shut out of the Lamar Hunt proper. And then they changed oh, it wow. again. So in 2002, when we qualified, the way to get in is you had to reach the regional, you had to become the regional champion. And in the amateur soccer, you have four regions. So we qualified by being the regional champion, went on, won the national semifinal, lost in the national final. And that also put us into Lamar. So I, I saw some of that online too. Just traditionally for these amateur teams, qualification is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, we qualified again a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, COVID shut the tournament down. U.S. Soccer right. held our spot the next year, and then they canceled the tournament again. Uh, wow. The third year, they said, you got to go back, back through qualifying. So some of these guys were, you know, gutted and devastated. And yeah. uh, we, we didn't make it through qualifying. Uh, and then, you know, this year we obviously did. So some of those guys have now either aged out or moved on to over 30s. and that, So that's like a tough part, too, because they earned it and, um, you know, never got the chance to play in it. Um, so, you know, you almost have to win three or four big games, um, you know, to get in. 
So for us, really, this is like round five. Um, wow. So it's not it's it's different qualifying than it is for you know some of these pro teams. Um, so to say that like we've only had a few shots at it, we've we've had plenty of shots at it. It's just not that easy. Yeah, that that sounds incredibly difficult. That sounds. I mean, being in the southeast, we have, we have a lot of college football um, programs here, and it sounds like you're trying to make the playoffs as like a G five team. Uh, it, it's a much higher bar, and it's a very limited number of uh, opportunities. Yeah, and then when U.S. Soccer and the MLS were having the little argument this year, uh, you know, at one point I'm like, uh oh, if this if this tournament doesn't go off again, you know, oh. I mean, what 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 kind of luck do we have, and what do we got to do? Um, so, you know, and and obviously, you know, on our you know on our 68 acres, we have some beautiful fields. The problem is some of the requirements, you know, for this game. And for this time of year up here, I mean, we have a beautiful grass fields that are really just opening this week. Um, the requirements of the scoreboard and the showers and the and the bleachers. I mean, I could have taken Charlotte down. Uh, we have a swim club on site. We could have we could have put them in the in the showers down there, but I don't think they would have liked it. Um, so you know, we had that's one of the biggest regrets is that we have to uh, play this game, um, you know, at a local school. We were lucky to find one that was willing to have us, and and that's been great. Um, but we're one of our main goals is to try and get Charlotte back to the club so they can see it and see what we're all about. Because there's not many places great. like it. Uh, that that would be fantastic. I'm sure they would love that. Um, I, I was just uh, talking with the club yesterday and uh, about their travel arrangements. It looks like the the tournament is going to pay for them to fly up there, so they're not going to be stuck on a bus. Um, what does it mean for you guys to be hosting and to be able to really show off um, not only the amount of work that you put in to get there, but to show off like your facilities? Um, I'll talk to I'll talk to the organization and you know try to make sure they get out to the actual um, club. We're trying to get them back after the game. Um, you know, for one, just come back, come come to our Ratskeller bar, have some beers with us. You know that that's one of the things for us. You know, win or lose, as soon as that game's over, it's, you know, it's it's got to be put aside no matter how, how hard you want to kick each other on the field. You know, our goal <laughs> is to bring them back, have a beer with them, and, and if they beat us, great, wish them luck in the next round. Um, so we're, we're working on that. I think they're going to do it, which is pretty cool. Um, we're hoping they'll come up, t- check out the piece of the Berlin Wall that we have because we know that's pretty unique. Um, Tell me about that. What's, what, what's up? You guys have a, a piece of the Berlin Wall? Yeah, so uh, Ronald Reagan has a couple sections in his library. Uh, right. And other than that, there's only a handful of other pieces in North America. So we have a piece that Lufthansa flew over. Uh, the German-American Society um, pick, you know, picked us to keep it since we um, you know, were from that region, from, you know, from the east. And uh, it sits in a garden in front of our clubhouse, and it's pretty awesome. It can be pretty emotional at times for people to come see it. Um, yeah. But if you're a history buff, it's awesome. The graffiti's still on it. You can walk up, touch it, take pictures. So a lot of teams, when they come to visit us, you know, that's that's a, a good good spot to snap some pictures. That's incredible. My uh, my dad actually lived in Germany for seven years uh, with the army uh, before the wall came down. So uh, I, I grew up kind of hearing stories about, you know, what that was like. And, and he would travel, I, I suppose, between both sides and just the differences between them. Um, but having a club so so steeped in culture and having a shot uh, to host a, a nationally um, more exposed uh, uh, type of opportunity, I guess you'd say, because it, it's going to be broadcast. We just learned they're going to be streaming this game on USL.com. Um, as far as the platform and the visibility, uh, do you feel like that's more of the accomplishment or is it the, the sense of achievement for your club? Yeah, it's, it's almost like the reward. You know, the funny thing is the other tournaments that we enter, like we're, we're in them to win them, right? We want to win our league. Right. Our goal is to get into the, both our state finals every year. Um, we, we didn't do that in the Amateur Cup, but because it's the 100th anniversary of the Amateur Cup, we got a bid for reaching the semifinals. And luckily, out of the hat, drew a drew a, a a home game against the Metro DC winner on April seventh. So we have a ton of other soccer to play, uh, okay. and we're really hoping to win all those tournaments. You know, this is the one tournament we're not going to win, 
So it's come out here, have a good showing, make it an event. It's more of a celebration of soccer. I think what okay. they're going to like is we're going to bring every one of our youth teams there. And, you know, our goal was to make it a sea of green. And um, we, the day we qualified, when the guy hit the last penalty kick to put us in, the, the youth players are the ones that stormed the field. And it was oh, awesome. Great. And so even the that's team fantastic. that came down that day from North Jersey, they were just like, we've never seen anything like this. This was awesome. So, you know, we, we, we know if you come to play us, we're gonna get, you're going to get a great experience. I love that. Um, I mean, once again, apologies. I, I have a giant uh, Casey Musgraves billboard right across the uh, alley nice. from me here, blowing up my, my face here. I, I'm in Nashville for an away trip. And uh, next week, I'm actually planning on going to two U.S. Open Cup games, one in Columbia, South Carolina, the other in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, yep. I'm not able to make it up uh, this time uh, to Pennsylvania, but, you know, it sounds like you have a wonderful facility here. Could you tell me, as far as your team right now, are there any players that have been through the pipeline all the way through the youth clubs up to the, the first team? Yeah, I got – I probably have seven or eight players that played youth soccer at the club at some point. Um, the um, – well, one of them is on a red card suspension and has to sit this game. He's absolutely devastated. No, no way. Uh, yeah, is that, Kevin, is that Kevin Smallen the, has to sit this one. Evan is that Bears, from the U.S. Open Cup qualifying, or is that from a, a he, different he got the, competition? He got the red card in the last in the extra time of the last qualifier before we went to no. PKs. Um, so he's devastated. Evan Vare, who hit the final PK, it's his brother's bachelor party. You know, he but he grew up playing at the glove. He, you know, he's out. So that's yeah. that's one of the challenges of amateur soccer that I don't know that everybody else really gets. Like we all do something else other than soccer during the day, and I just okay. can't control. It's not easy to get everybody there every time. So um, that's actually one of my um, one of my questions I got from our supporters group with Independence was uh, being an amateur club. Like, what are some of the jobs that you guys have outside of soccer? Just to give us an idea of the the lifestyle. Yeah. So we're our our. Um, most of our guys, we pick them up or they come back to us right after school, <clears throat> come from good programs. Um, I, I think at last count, I have 19 Division One captains in the program right okay. now. Wow. So good schools, our local schools here, Drexel, LaSalle, Temple, Penn, um, Ryder, Princeton, Lafayette. Uh, oh, wow. And I have James Madison, Delaware, um, Elon. Uh, Marist, Mammoth, um, so Dartmouth, um, Georgetown. So there's a lot of guys that played Ryder where I went. I have some Ryder guys in the program. So there's okay. guys that played good programs, and then you know a couple guys from D two and D three schools that, that played at really good levels too. So when we recruit these guys, if they're not from the club, you know, basically we tell them like, you want to still play, you get at your job, you move to Philadelphia, Philadelphia, suburban Philadelphia, and you still want to play after the games. Do you want to sit on a guy's tail, like drink, drinking beers in a middle school? Or do you want to be a part of something like this, where you're going to be an instant role model. And after the game, you can come in, eat with the other team, have beers there. There's going to be some old guy at the bar that you don't know. That's going to tell you, you played like shit or you played great. And they're still going to buy you a beer. And oh, by the way, when you find out who they are, they might just have been the college all American or ex pro, right? So right. that's the difference here. You know, we got we, we're up to like fifth generations of players, you know. So th there's there's guys that just want to come out and see a good game on a Sunday, and they pick our club, you know, which makes it makes it pretty cool. So with that said, I mean, I got guys that are you know goes from everything: finance guys, chemical engineers, um, accountants. Two of the guys are finance guys. They just opened up a cookie business called Blueprint Cookie. Um, you know, so they've been slaving away making cookies and it's been hard to make everything. Um, uh, gosh, you name it. And um, there's one or two guys that are like still trying to play and, and, and do some coaching. Um, but, you know, uh, some, some really sharp guys, man. So it's great. And it's an awesome place to network, too. So yeah, the, the, sure. the dynamics of the club is, that, like I said, it's a family club first, but, you know, maybe I didn't go to school for your major, but one of the other guys at the club did, and it's a good way for you to network if, uh, you know, you're looking for a job. That's awesome. Uh, are there any 
notable former players that have gone on to play professionally, or do you feel like it's more of uh, uh, the networking and the getting a chance to continue that that kind of career after college? Well, Sean Peckham's going to be there. He's one of our, um, you know, he's a lifelong V kid that, you know, I met probably when he was, you know, six or seven. Um, he was a youth national team player, played at Lafayette. Um, he played in some of the lower lower leagues, but um, you got a got a uh, a master's degree as a grad assistant, and then came back and has been here ever since. Um, you had uh, Steve Newman's in our program, who was like a, a number three pick back in the day in the MLS. Um, oh wow! Andrew Hopino or Antoine Hopino is playing with us now. He lives in the area, um, so you know people know him. I think the last one of his last games was uh, losing the uh, final with the union. So, you know, so there's, there's some guys that have, you, you know, some real, some real talent. Um, uh, got a little younger over the last couple of years. Like I said, a lot of those guys that put us in uh, before COVID, um, you know, have kind of moved up right. to the over thirties. We were fortunate. We never change. We never do like wholesale changes. It's usually a handful of guys. Like there's another joke that when people sign with VE, they sign for life because they never really leave and go anywhere else. They'll, they'll, if they leave, it's just to go to the over thirties or the over forties, you know, and awesome. that's the goal. Hopefully they have such a good time that when it's time, they'll come back and they'll coach um, their family here. And so, you know, of our 75 youth coaches, there's probably 20 to 30 that played here at some level. Um, and that that's what makes it special. And it's all volunteer. No one gets paid at this club, including myself. It's incredible. So I, I guess let me jump into kind of a, a bigger topic here. With all of that said, and understanding your place in the soccer landscape, what does grassroots soccer in the United States mean to you? And and how would you like to see it develop? It's 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 pretty crazy with the the, the money that and the, the competition for players uh, that we see now, I find that to be uh, a little troubling. We try to focus on everything, you know, definitely at our youth level when we get to 77 and 9v9, it, it's all player development. So we try not to focus too much on the wins and losses. If there are players that are that good that they need to move on, you know, we'll, we'll move them on ourselves. We'll, we'll make the phone calls to the union or wherever they want to go. But for the most part, um, they have as good of, if not better, coaching here right in front of them. So we try to tell them you don't always have to shop. The grass isn't always greener, you know. And I think that's that's one of the things that sets us apart is that we have that quality of people just looking to give back. Um, so, you know, my view might be a little tainted because I realize there's an awful lot of people getting paid a lot of money to coach soccer. Um, you know, I, I have a day job, you know. So uh, I'm still coaching 110 games a year uh, yeah. across, across a bunch of different levels, you know, but um, I'm, I'm not seeing a dime for it. Hey, that's something you and I both have in common. Uh, yeah. You're doing it at a much higher level than me, but uh, I, I appreciate the time. Any, any final thoughts or um, expectations for this game against Charlotte? Have you, have you started scouting any tape? Yeah, we've done a little scouting. I know they got a game. Uh, we'll probably have some guys watching that game tomorrow night. You know, we're we're excited for it. Um, you know, in a perfect world, right? We'd say, hey, maybe they don't travel well, or maybe they're maybe they're tired from this game. And and uh, but I, I I'm sure they're coming ready to play. Um, I would like to think that they're looking at this as wow, they can go a couple rounds and maybe pick off an MLS team. You know, because they they get the same kind of exposure. You know, that we would get with the win, but. We, we want to make it a good game. We want to make it a good show. And um, we, we just want to uh, – hopefully they come up here and they know that they got to be a part of something pretty cool playing VE. That's awesome, man. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Just for the record, I put out a tweet that was instantly attacked by a much, much larger account than me, and it ended up blowing up. And that's the reason we're talking now. But uh, I never meant any harm by it. I was having a little bit of tongue-in-cheek fun. I had mentioned on our previous podcast, I've never heard of this team. I don't know how to say it. And my tweet was clearly a response to that to say, okay, here's some information on them. And it looks like, you know, tongue in cheek, your website has the summer camp part. 
it looks like they're a summer camp. I now know that you guys have a lot more than just a summer camp. You have a lot going on. Um, and I, actually, I'm just, I do have one more fan question. What is your favorite beer that you guys have uh, at your uh, uh, brewery <clears throat> after the game? Well, we, we do like beer. There is a, there's a definite uh, drinking culture up here. And uh, that our, ho- hopefully after this game, we'll be drinking out of the boots. But uh, nice. with, our, with Hofbrau as our current sponsor, that's what we're going to go to. Okay. And, um, you know, hopefully you get up sometime when the weather breaks here. Our beer garden's open all summer long, live music. Um, that's the backside of the 68 acres that we have. And it's just a great chill place in the summer. People can come. It's a very safe place. Kids run around, parents eat, have a few beers. So if you're ever up this way, you're invited. Um, I would love to. Hey, that, that I, would mean a lot. I, so I did see that. I saw, I saw some of the, some people sent me some other responses. They're like, do they, do they realize you've been coaching this team longer than that club's been in existence and things like that? Oh yeah. And I, and I said, hey, we don't need to get involved in that. You know, they're, they're, of course they probably never heard of us. If you've been up in Philly, you've heard of us. Um, yeah. You know, we have a great reputation, you know, amongst the region and the places we played, you know, but we, we have been around for a long time. So, you know, we're, we're, we're carrying more of the history than they are, you know? Yeah. Uh, hey, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary. So that's the game tomorrow night. They're bringing back the uh, a lot of the alumni, and uh, we're very excited for 10 years. Soccer has a history in Charlotte, but it, it was dormant for about 20 years there. Uh, we actually won the national championship in 1982, the uh, professional um, with the Carolina Lightning, uh, 22,000 in attendance. Um, awesome. So th- there is a history in Charlotte. We are a soccer city. We have three professional level teams and I think seven or eight altogether. So we're very focused on soccer in the Carolinas. And I was glad to uh, have the opportunity to talk with you and learn more about uh, your club in your area. Um, hey, thank you so much. I hope I can get up there and have a beer with you guys. Yeah, we'd love it. Yep. Thanks. And, uh, you know, we, we wish all the boys luck. We look forward to hosting them. Thanks. Good luck on Thursday, coach. Yep. See you now.